guys, Libinis here. So today I'm going to be doing my character analysis of Toko Fukawa and first of all, let me just say that I am so excited to be doing these videos again. I really, really like doing these character analysis videos and I'm really excited that you guys seem to like them too. It feels like it's just been way too long since I've been able to do one of these with the hiatus and with the episode reviews. So I'm super stoked to be doing this again. But before I start, there is a bit more information about the NIS event coming up this month that I want to talk about. I already made a video talking about most that will be happening, so if you'd like, you can go ahead and check that out. I'll leave a link in the description. But some of the newest information that I didn't include in that video is that Kadaka will actually be a special guest at the event, so an English release date for V3 is starting to look really likely, which is very exciting. But I just wanted to mention that really quickly, and moving on to the analysis, I am going to be covering this a little bit differently than some of my previous ones because there's just a lot to talk about. I'm basically going to be starting with her history, mixing in some of my own theories I have regarding it, then I'll analyze how she acts in Dangrafa 1, and then how she changes in another episode. And like usual, I'll close out the video with trivia about her character. But anyways, without further ado, let's go ahead and begin. So the earliest event in Fukawa's life that has been referenced in the series is surprisingly enough her birth. We learn another episode through a conversation that Fukawa has with Kamaru that from the moment of her birth, her family life has been incredibly unstable. She describes that at the same time she was born, another child was born as well, with a medical condition that ended the child's life that same day. And although this wasn't incredibly uncommon, there was a mix-up at the hospital and they weren't able to decipher which mother's child was the one that passed away. They would have easily been able to figure out whose child was whose with a blood test, but both mothers declined because they both wanted the child who had passed. And since neither of them would take the blood test, Fukawa ended up having two mothers. What's bothered me for ages is the question, why would the mothers want their child to be dead? I originally thought that maybe it had something to do with the father. Based off of Toko and Kamara's conversation, we learned that the women were unaware that they had both slept with the same man until the day of their children's birth. So I thought that maybe they hated Toko and the other child because it had the DNA of a man who betrayed them. But after thinking about it more, I don't think that's the case. The main reason being that Fukawa also mentions that her father was unmarried to either of these women, so the potential dynamic of the relationship changes. He could have been two-timing them, or he could have simply had one-night stands with both of these women. I personally theorize that it's more likely that the latter is true based off the way these lines are worded. Fukawa states that they had both slept with the same man, singular. I assume if they were both in a relationship with him, or even if one of them was in a relationship with him, she would have stated was or were sleeping with instead. This may seem like nitpicking, but in that same exact scene when she refers to having more than one mother by saying them, Kamaru attempts to correct her and she responds stating, I'm a novelist, I wouldn't misspeak like that. So going by that logic, I think it's a fair assumption to say that she wouldn't misspeak when stating the other line as well. So looking at this as the big picture, I choose to believe that these women's distaste for taking responsibility for their children didn't stem from their relationship with the father, so it had to be something else. I believe it had to do with their lifestyle, most likely that the lifestyle they lived would be severely interrupted with the responsibility of a child. Because of this, I also do tend to believe that the father more than likely had little to no involvement in Toko's life growing up. But of course, as always, this is just my own personal theory, let me know if you have your own. It can be noted that Toko was definitely maltreated by these women. In another episode, it's mentioned that she was locked in a closet for three days straight without food, causing her to grow a pathological fear of the dark. It's also revealed in the franchise that she suffered from severe bullying in school as well. One of the earliest events mentioned regarding it was when she was in third grade. It's described that she was framed for stealing someone's lunch and was blamed for the theft. In response, the class tied her up to a jungle gym with a garden hose. We also know from another episode that at some point in her life she befriended a stink bug that she named Kameko, who she believed to be a special insect that can understand human feelings. She states that Kameko is the only one who also knows what it's like to be called smelly and gets quite emotional when she learns that the insect may still be alive. In her free time events in Dangrampa 1, we learn the story of her first love and what eventually led her to becoming a famous author. She states that when she was in elementary school, there was a boy she used to talk to often. 
She felt that he was the only boy that she had ever felt comfortable talking to. She eventually learns that he and his family are planning on moving to Shikoku, so she decides to confess her love for him in a love letter since she's too shy to do it in person. The next day, she finds the love letter pinned to the bulletin board and that the boy did this as a way to mock her. She learns that he always hated how often she talked to him and that he was ridiculed for it quite often. This obviously caused her severe emotional trauma, but one of the teachers who had read the love letter told her that she had a talent for writing which led her to pursue becoming a novelist. It can also be noted that in Genociders Free Time events, we learn that she actually follows him to Shikoku and kills him, confirming that Genocider developed fairly early in Fukawa's lifetime. Some could argue that she went to Shikoku later in life, but I tend to believe that she was still fairly young as Nagi states when looking at the Genocider case files that the ages of the victims range quite a bit. The youngest that we see in the pages shown in the game shows the age of 14, but there could have been some who were younger as well. Although we do know from the canon that Fukawa blames her mother's for Genocider's creation, we still don't know which event was the final catalyst that brought Genocider to life. But I do have a theory about how I believe it happened based off of what we know from the canon. I personally believe that the main cause of Genocider's creation is from severe emotional trauma. Obviously, there is already confirmation that Toko suffered a massive amount of emotional trauma growing up, and it's also mentioned in the canon that Genocider was created to fill the void that Toko's novels couldn't fill, the void being full of anger and emptiness. My theory for the creation of Genocider is that she was created after the boy who was moving to Shikoku rejected her and humiliated her, that he became became Genocider's first victim. The reason why I believe this was the event that triggered it is because before, as we know, she had a very dysfunctional family and home life and that she could not retreat to friends in school because she was severely bullied there as well. So in order to fill this void of anger and emptiness that was building up, she turned to romance novels. They probably told stories of women who were outcasts like her and promised her and that these types of women like her would find true love in a prince charming that could save her from all this misery. And these books implanting this sort of idealistic version of love in her mind is probably what made her become so obsessed with it. So when she met this boy and he didn't immediately dismiss her like everyone else, she probably projected this image of Prince Charming onto him. But after he rejected and humiliated her so greatly, I believe that this dream of being saved by a Prince Charming sort of died inside of her and that she came to the conclusion that she would have to fill this void herself. But since Toko is an anxious and cowardly girl, Genesis was created to fill this void for her. Another section of the canon that sort of backs up this idea is that in Dangrapa 1, it appears that being humiliated or mocked is the greatest fear that she has in social settings. As we see, she seems to have accepted being alone since she so quickly pushes others away and puts words in their mouths. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And as always, this is my personal theory. Let me know if you have your own about how you believe Genocider might have been created. But moving back to her history, one of the later stories of Fukawa's life also had to do with love. In junior high, she was asked out on a date completely out of the blue. She was so excited that she spent three days trying to come up with the perfect first date for them. She eventually settled on them going to see an action-packed triple feature movie screening. But halfway through the first movie, her date abandons her and she later learns that he had lost a bet and that his friends forced him to ask her out on the date as his punishment. But all of these events are the ones that molded her into the mess that we see in Dangrapa 1. So so now that we have a better understanding as to why she acts the way she does, let's go ahead and try to figure out her thought process at what I like to argue is her lowest point. First, I'd like to look at how she acts towards Nagi and the others in Dangrapa 1. One thing that can be noted is just how hypocritical most, if not all, of her actions are. An example is that it's obvious that she wants friendship, but every time someone extends friendship, simply compliments, or shows any positive interest in her, she immediately dismisses them and begins shoving words in their mouth while self-deprecating herself. I believe that the main reason she does this is because of her fear of being humiliated or rejected, as I mentioned before. I believe that the fear of this is so great for her that she automatically begins pushing people away and putting words in their mouth so that she won't have to ever experience being tricked or mocked again. Like I mentioned before, the idea of being mocked and humiliated seems to be what causes her the most anxiety, which is why I believe that story previously mentioned was the one that triggered the creation of Genocider. Another reason I believe she's so quick to self-deprecate herself and push others away as well is because when she was growing up, she was at the most vulnerable and impressionable ages in her life, and during this time, she was essentially treated like dirt and told that she was horrible from her family, 
peers, etc. So because of this, her brain is automatically trained to believe that anyone she meets will automatically hate her. And again, in order to avoid hearing the potential insults and mockery, she begins pushing her own words into their mouths. She also seems to be hypocritical when it comes to judging other people as well. For example, she'll mock other girls for dressing too sexual or reading what she considers to be trashy novels, and yet she'll have overly sexualized fantasies about Byakuya. It's interesting because when she insults other people for reasons such as this, it's as if she she puts herself on a pedestal as if she thinks she's better than everyone else, but as mentioned before, she's the first to insult herself and claim that she's the worst of them all. I believe her being so hypocritical with putting herself on a pedestal could be related to how often she daydreams about her having the ideal life she envisions for herself. Essentially, I believe that when she is unable to read novels that allow her to escape from the cruel, harsh reality, she creates her own fantasies to cope with her insecurities. As we see in her fantasy in Dangrapa 3, she seems to think of herself as being much greater than everyone else. For example, her looks compared to Kamaru's in this fantasy. And I believe that maybe she uses these fantasies as a way to comfort herself into believing that she's simply hated because she's better than everyone else. And this could occasionally seep out into the real world until she quickly reminds herself that in reality she has been immediately hated so often that she must be just as awful as everyone says. Another detail that can be noted in Dangrapa 1 is that she constantly would stick with a group mentality and would rarely, if ever, step out and voice her own opinion. And an example of this would be when everyone suspected Nagi of killing Mizuno in the first trial, she was extremely quick to go along with the group and accuse him as often as possible. This more than likely has to do with her wanting to feel included. Even if she knew in her heart that she was disliked by the group, coming together with them and accusing or harassing someone alongside them probably made her feel as if she wasn't the most outcast individual. The next thing I'm going to talk about is her relationship with Byakuya, and at first glance it's easy to assume that her attraction is based solely on looks and that it's a two-dimensional relationship, but after analyzing it some, there's definitely a bit more depth to it than that. I think her initial attraction did definitely have to do with his looks. He probably reminded her of the men she would read about in her escapism novels, rich, eligible, beautiful, but I think another thing that contributed to her attraction and obsession with him is that in Fukawa's free time events, it's evident that she wants revenge or to prove herself to those who wronged her. The evidence being that in the first free time event he spent with her, she at one point automatically begins assuming that Nagi is making fun of her, and she states, someday I'll show them, I'll get pretty someday and show them all. So I believe another reason why she's so obsessed with attaining Tagami's love is because if he did at some point ever love her back, it would prove to those who bullied her so badly in the past that she's actually pretty and better than them. Since in her mind, Tagami would be the ideal boyfriend since he's attractive and successful. Like I mentioned before, Genocider was created as a way for Fukawa to fill the void of anger and emptiness. My theory regarding this is that she takes the lives of attractive boys to fill this void for two different reasons. First, having the final say on whether someone lives or dies gives you ultimate control over someone life. This is something Fukawa never had growing up, which is control. From what we know, it seems that she was constantly pushed around, mentally and even physically abused by her mothers, so she never got a say in how she wished to be treated. So that's the first way that Genocider fills the void, in finally giving her that control that she never had. Secondly, she takes the lives of young handsome men because she was taught through her escapism novels that they were the key to her happiness and an escape to her misery. But after what happened with the Shikoku boy, she came came to the conclusion that they are exactly what she believes she'll never be able to obtain and what she thinks she doesn't deserve. Connecting again to my theory about how I believe after the Shikoku boy, she internally gave up on the idea of finding true love until she met Byakuya, of course. But in a way, this is the ultimate revenge because as genocider, she's taking what she could never have as Fukawa. Control by killing attractive men since they have become the symbol in her life of happiness that she feels she can never obtain. So a reason I believe she was able to stop killing after meeting Byakuya is because being with him is an ultimate revenge fantasy against those who wronged her. And if she has him, she could feel that part of her that wishes so badly for revenge. But this is the best theory that I could come up with, so 
let me know if you have one of your own. Next, I'm going to talk about what makes Tagami different and why I believe she actually thinks that she has a chance with him. And strangely enough, the reason is because of how often he insults her vocally. Like I said before, since Fukawa was constantly bombarded growing up about how awful she was, she began to believe it and assume that everyone thought the worst of her. That's why when she meets people like Nagi or Kamaru who show her positive interest, she automatically assumes that they're lying or they're out to humiliate her. But since Tagami very openly and very bluntly vocalizes what Fukawa thinks of herself, she believes that he is the one who is truly being honest with her, and because of this she knows that he will never trick or humiliate her. So in a way, he's safe for her to love because he can never expose her to her greatest fear, which is what the boy who moved to Shikoku did. And these reasons are why she takes his verbal lashings as him caring for her. Next, I'd like to talk about the progression her character made from Danganronpa 1 to another episode. In another episode, we see several progressions that her character makes off screen, including her being much less appearingly anxious in social situations, although the self-deprecation is still there. Also in another episode, we see that Fukawa has much better control over Genocider. As we see, she's now able to switch personalities using a stun gun. Another thing we see is that she no longer goes the majority and is much braver and willing to stand up for what she believes is right. We see this when her and Kamari meet the adults for the first time in another episode and they learn that the adults were content to just sit around and wait until their deaths. A notable thing here is that Fukawa even credits her newfound bravery to Nagi, stating that he always moved forward no matter how difficult the situation and that that was why she was alive today. It definitely appears that that being in the 78th class's killing game and seeing Nagi save everyone including herself against all odds showed her that having even a small bit of hope can go a long way. I think it was really essential for her character because it shows that even though it's small, she did have a bit more hope when facing difficult situations, whether it be socially or against despair, and that's what I believed allowed her to open up to Kamaru, even as slow as a process as that was. I do want to take some time to discuss the dynamic between her her and Kumari's relationship as well. The main scene I want to talk about is from Ultra Despair Girls when it's revealed that Toko was planning on exchanging Kamaru for Byakuya. Of course, as we all know, Toku and Kamari began becoming close up until this point, so we see in this scene that Fukawa begins to act as if she doesn't care for Kamari at all before turning into Genocider and losing to her on purpose in order for Kamari to not feel guilty about escaping Toa City without her. It appears that she also did this as a way to let Kamari decide for herself if she wanted to run away or fight back, since as Fukawa said, she was constantly relying on her to make decisions for the both of them before. From previous scenes, we see Fukawa pushing others away as usual, but in this scene, it's actually for the sake of protecting the other person and not herself. This in and of itself shows just how much Kamari was able to positively impact her up until this point. I can only imagine how hard it was for Fukawa to act this way towards Kamari, because as we know, Fukawa never had a single friend up up until this point. She constantly pushed others away due to her low self-esteem and trust issues, and to know that you've betrayed the only person in your life that has actually been a good friend to you, and to lie and push them away just because you know it's best for them, had to be incredibly hard. She probably felt even more so that the bullies and her parents were right, accepting such a horrible thing she had done to the one kind person she had met. It's such a sad scene when you really think about the amount of guilt and self-loathing that Fukawa must have felt at the time. But but when you see Kamaru step up and forgive her, even after learning that she was originally betrayed, it shows to Fukawa that Kamaru wasn't going anywhere and that the two would always be there for each other here on out. This scene definitely sets their friendship up well for the rest of the game and, in my opinion, when we begin to see them really start to become true friends. I also love that we see Kamaru encouraging Fukawa here, stating that she'll always be there to support and help her when she needs it, which parallels the scene right before the two of them fight Big Bang Monica Akuma, except the roles are reversed. I really loved the relationship that grew between these two and how greatly it improved Fukawa's character. I still to this day believe that she has gotten the best character development in the whole series. But in order to avoid this video being over an hour long, I'm gonna just stop right there on analyzing her and Kamari's relationship. I may in the future do a video just analyzing them in Ultra Despair Girls because I really think that could just be a whole video in and of itself 
itself. So maybe I'll make a sequel to this video, but in order for this video not to take a month and for it to not be an hour long, I might just have to come back to that. I just wanted to analyze this scene because I think it highlights their relationship the best and was a really defining moment for them. Moving on to the trivia portion of this video, as usual, I'll be heading to the Wikia page. The first interesting thing I want to say is that Kadaka actually says that Toko represents the game's worldwide view the most. And it can also be noted that she is the character designer's favorite character in the first game, as well as one of Kadaka's favorite characters too. There was also an unused execution made for Fukawa called First Kiss Prank. This is described as Toko is thrown into complete darkness. In the distance, Byakuya can be seen, so she begins to run towards him. Suddenly, a huge roller coaster appears between the two of them. Though Toko tries desperately to escape, the roller coaster catches up with her and presses her paper thin, killing her. Another interesting bit of trivia is the fact that Fukawa's character design probably underwent some of the most changes out of all the characters from Danganronpa 1, starting from her design in Distrust all the way to how she appears now. Also, Toko's last name, Fukawa, consists of the characters for Rodden and River. Fu is also the first character in the word Fujoshi, a girl who enjoys reading manga featuring male homoerotic relationships, a term that Genocider uses to describe herself. Toko also consists of the characters for Winter and Child. It also states on the Wikia page that it can be assumed about Toko's two mothers that one is Japanese while the other might be from a Western country. Evidence of that can be found during school mode when Toko asks about which breakfast she prefers, Japanese or Western, she mentions that one of her mothers liked Japanese while the other liked Western. It's also implied that Toko does not take showers very often. In Danganronpa 3, she even appears to be afraid of bathing. Toko also suffers from a pathological fear of the dark, blood, and ghosts. And in Danganronpa 1, Celeste even mentions that she has hemophobia, which is the fear of blood. And Toko also appears as a guest character in Chain Chronicle Brave New Continent. Her her max ATK is 7240, while her max HP is 5740. Her weapon is the fountain pen of the literary master, and its ability is doubled attack power. Her death blow is called Delusion Dream. It recovers the ally's HP a bit and cures debilitating conditions. But this concludes my video. I hope you guys enjoyed. It was a bit of a monster to make, I'm not gonna lie. It um, was a lot of research, just um, having to jump from the first game to another episode back and forth and connecting things and she's a pretty confusing character I'm not gonna lie but I hope you guys enjoyed the video let me know if you have any theories of your own or any analysis type posts that you have or anything that you think about her character that maybe I didn't point out or something you think a little bit differently about just let me know in the comment section for my next couple of videos I will be doing a trivia video probably in the future and then I'll be doing another character analysis the mods have actually been <laughs> taking count of who's been requested the most. Right now, Sonya and Hajime are pretty much tied. I think Hajime is winning a little bit at this point. So as usual, if you want, feel free to request a character that you would like for me to do an analysis on and I'll get around to it as best as I can. But anyways, like I said before, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I will see you real soon. Subscribe to Weeby News for more hope-filled videos.